Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. I hope you are ready for some... How can we put this? Um... <laughs> I, I Honestly, I don't even know how to begin to describe what you're about to see. However, uh, today's main event is kind of short. The entire battle lasts less than 10 minutes. So in order to pad things out and give you value for money, we're going to start things out before the main event with this very short clip. Honestly, it's only four minutes long from one drunken sailor in the Japanese tier eight cruiser, the Megami. Notice I didn't say light cruiser or heavy cruiser because that depends entirely on which guns you outfit the Megami with. It can be one or the other. Most people, however, tend to go for the light cruiser armament, the, I think, 155 millimeter guns, which have good range, good rate of fire, and very nice high explosive DPM. None of which is going to be important in this clip. As one drunken sailor steams south for the central cap, he's in a tier 9 battle in his tier 8 cruiser, but again none of that is really important. Mild spoiler warning for you, one drunken sailor here is going to suffer from a massive and fatal rush of shit to the brain in about two minutes. And he is, in fact, going to die horribly and pointlessly right at the start of this battle. But that's only really half of the story. You see, the other star of this clip, it's not just one drunken sailor, it's also the enemy Yugamo, the Japanese Tier 9 destroyer. He goes by the name of Sound Ace, and he, along with one drunken sailor, is the other reason why this is one of the funniest clips I have seen in a long time. Both of them are good sports, both of them have a sense of humour, and I've probably said too much. Let's just wait and watch and see how this pans out. So, friendly Minsk up ahead. Being a little aggressive, more aggressive than I would be in a destroyer with uh, stealth as bad as that. And there's the Yugamo. So, shots out. High explosive loaded, of course. Minsk has been forced to beat a hasty retreat. And one drunken sailor is about to make his fatal error of judgment. But before he does that, he's just going to try to get his torpedoes away. Yeah, they, they're not going to hit anything. He's going to have to wait until he clears the island. But what he's failed to take into consideration as he's angling to get a clear line of fire in his torpedo tubes is the collision warning indicator. Yeah. And those are Yugamo torpedoes. And they do a lot of damage. And he's dead. So, like I said, didn't exactly cover himself in glory there. And the enemy Yugamo, who was watching the torpedoes from a distance, has a thing or two to say in chat. There it is. Wow. Sailing straight lines much? And of course, one drunken sailor has no comeback to that one. He knows he screwed up. All he can really do is at least try to explain why he screwed up, and there it is in chat. Didn't see the island. Which which island's that, one drunken sailor? Would it be that one by any chance? <laughs> yes, it was. However, while the Yugamo is busy laughing his ass off at uh, one drunken sailor's predicament, it turns out karma is a bit of a bitch. <laughs> yes. Yes, if you're going to laugh at the misfortune of somebody who sells into what were pretty obvious torpedoes, try to make sure you're not about to do exactly the same thing yourself. And if you do, at least make sure you've got a sense of humour about it. And to be completely fair, both One Drunken Sailor and Sound Ace absolutely did. So um, I'm not going to say well done to both of them, <laughs> for what should be pretty obvious reasons, but at least they had a laugh. And that brings us swiftly on to today's main event. And honestly, I wasn't planning on showing you this today. I had another video entirely lined up and was about to start editing and recording when I thought, you know what, I'll just check one more email. Have a look at one more replay. And this was it. And immediately, my plans changed. Because this is absolutely ridiculous. So, this is Tom Cyrex in the British Tier 10 battlecruiser HMS Incomparable. He's in an asymmetric battle, more on that in a moment. But you may have already realised, and at least one person on the enemy team has realised, something that Tom hasn't. Any second now, it's going to pop up in chat. Just keep an eye on the chat window. Any second now. 
There it is. You got enough bots there, friend. Every single last member, with the exception of himself, on Tom's team is a bot. Yep. Really. So, this is a new game mode, Asymmetric Battles. Well, it's not a new game mode, it's been in the game before. But it's back, and for a limited period. Asymmetric Battles are going to be running between the 3rd and the 17th of February, and the basic idea is this. One team will consist of Tier 9 and 10 ships, with no less than 6, but no more than 8 ships on the team. Obviously, this is Tom's team. The second team will consist of Tier 7 and 8 ships, with no less than 9, and no more than 12 ships per team. So Tom's team, because they're all tier 10, only have six ships. Despite the fact that only one of the six is an actual player, the rest are all bots. The enemy team, because they're an even mix of tier seven and eight ships, have nine, and they're all players. I think it's fair to say that at this point, Tom was probably not having a warm fuzzy feeling in the pit of his stomach about his chances of actually managing to win this battle. <laughs> <laughs> He's effectively fighting one against nine, because let's face it, the bots are not very good. Generally, they might sail for an objective, but usually all they do is just charge straight towards the enemy guns blazing and die very, very quickly. That's why co-op battles tend to be over in two to four minutes. The bots are just really bad. However, I think it's possible, perhaps even extremely likely, that faced with all of this cannon fodder to farm damage on, the enemy team may not be taking things quite as seriously as they probably should. A sneaky 14,000 damage on the Vladivostok there from the incomparable's 508mm guns, each of which is capable of firing an armor-piercing shell that if it hits and scores a citadel will do nearly 20,000 damage. That'll teach the Vladivostok not to sail in straight lines, won't it? Or will it? <laughs> Another 47,000 damage. I'll bet that Vladivostok is wishing he had some flex tape right now. <laughs> and one thing about the bots is that when they sent blood in the water, they all focus their fire on the target with the lowest health. Which is a bit of a good news, bad news situation, because on the one hand they did just rob Tom of a kill, which he richly deserved, but on the other hand it would have been a bit of a shame to waste these 508mm shells on a target that only had 927 health left. We have also just lost one of the bots, the Minotaur, because they just rushed straight ahead, got himself torpedoed and sunk. So the amount of available cannon fodder to distract the enemy team is slowly being whittled Fire. down. Because if the enemy team would just focus their fire on Tom, and a couple of them are, but not nearly enough, they would be able to whittle him down very, very quickly, because while the Incomparable does pack some fearsome firepower, it is extraordinarily fragile, it has terrible armour, and takes huge damage from high explosive. Although, to be fair, not quite as much damage as Admiral Hippers take when they sit broadside on to the Incomparable's 508mm guns, at a range of 8.6 kilometers. Two down, seven to go. The upside to taking a lot of high explosive damage, however, is that you can heal back most of the high explosive damage. Oh, oh, King George V, you don't want to be doing that, sunshine. That's not a mistake you're going to be making twice in one battle. <laughs> oh, and the bots have managed to get a kill as well. Good on your bots. You can see the damage that he is taking here from these high explosive shells, but you may have also noticed how much damage he managed to repair from the high explosive shells that he was sustaining damage from. Oh, the Leon's going to regret that. <laughs> oh, only 14,000 damage. I guess it'll just have to do. Yes, of course, the Incomparable does get one of those specialised repair team consumables. As long as all you're taking is high explosive damage, you don't even have to bother wasting your damage control on it unless the fire is going to kill you because you can heal back pretty much all of it. These asymmetric battles, like I said, they're not a new thing in World of Warships. We have seen them, I think, at least once before. Definitely at least once. 
but they first raised their head in World of Tanks, where they were an abject failure. They called them historical battles. And they based them around some work that I actually took part in as a community member in World of Tanks, where we would organise battles based on actual historical tank battles that took place, you know, for real. You see, it worked when we were organising these games amongst ourselves, because we very quickly realised that you absolutely have to make sure that there isn't too much of a tier difference between the tanks involved. Oh, Lexington, what on earth are you doing? <laughs> and the rear turret. This is going to hurt. You might want to look away now, kids. Wow. Didn't actually sink him in one salvo. Yes, yeah, Sakazuki, I'm sure he'll finish the job once he reloads. You see, the reason why these asymmetric battles work in World of Warships and the reason why what they called historical battles didn't work when World of Tanks tried to do the same thing was because any warship in World of Warships is capable of damaging any other warship in World of Warships. Nice kill on the Lexington. Yes, Leon. We'll get to you in a moment. Uh, regardless of the tier spread, a tier 2 can do damage and potentially sink a tier 10. It's not the same in World of Tanks. And we tried to tell them this and give them the benefit of our experience, but of course, Wargaming didn't listen to us when they took our idea and turned it into a proper game mode in World of Tanks, and it was just an utter disaster. Bye bye, Leon. Thanks for turning up. Because while in World of Warships, it is entirely possible, providing you have the numbers on your side, for a team of tier 7 and 8 ships to defeat a smaller team of tier 9 or 10 ships, but that is not the case in World of Tanks, where lower tier tanks are often completely incapable of damaging higher tier tanks. And we try to tell them this. We told them, look, you can't have tier 5s fighting tier 9s. In fact, tier 5s against tier 7s is stretching it a bit, and ooh, that's probably going to hurt. And it did, although probably not quite as much as it should. You had to pick the kind of battles where the spread in tiers between the tanks that actually fought those battles is probably no more than one tier up or down. And in the cases where you did have battles in World War II, for example, the Kasserine Pass in the North Africa campaign, where Tigers took part and were fighting M3 Lees and Shermans and Crusaders, you have to put a tight cap on the number of people who can queue up in the Tigers and fill out the rest of the German side with Panzer threes and fours, as well as giving the players on the Allied side a huge numerical advantage. But of course, they didn't bother listening to us, so in the official World of Tanks game version, they ended up with people in Yag Tigers and Tiger Twos fighting Shermans. Except they didn't, because nobody was queuing up in the Shermans more than once. Oh, that's going to leave a mark. Thanks for turning up, Cleveland, but I'm afraid you zigged when you should have zagged. <laughs> and two of the bots are still alive. It's pretty impressive, by the way, the two destroyers, instead of just charging straight forward, they actually went for one of the objectives and flipped the cap. Now the York over there, and the Duke of York down to the south, are thinking, how did it all go so horribly, horribly wrong? <laughs> if there's only one player on the enemy team, how can we be losing this? And there goes the heel. So any chance that the Duke of York over there had to inflict a kill is, well, let's face it, extremely unlikely. And there's kill number seven. At 300,000 damage for Tom Cyrex as the only player on his team against a superior number of actual enemy players. You couldn't make this shit up. Congratulations, Tom. Extremely well done on that highly unlikely victory. And if all of you watching at home or on your mobile devices thought that what you saw in today's video was absurd because, well, let's be honest, it kind of was. Trust me, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because if you stick around tomorrow for the annual War Thunder video, I promise you're going to see something that makes this look reasonable. <laughs> Got that to look forward to for tomorrow's video. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this one. And as always, take care, stay safe. I'll catch you next time.